the what is the posterior malleolar fracture was uh, was something that uh, I guess it's about seven eight years ago. Me and my colleague Andy Malloy, um, we were struggling because some of the studies that we were uh, developing in our unit and some of the units around us, so Leicester as well, it didn't matter if you fixed it in the and the old fashioned way that 25% you below that you didn't fix and above that you did fix. They all seem to do badly. So um, we just started seeing them all and CTs became a uh, routine venture. Anyone who had a posture of malleolar fracture, even the smallest fragments like the one you see on the left there, still underwent a CT because especially if you've got a posture of medial fragment, sometimes you really can't see it. Um, and through all these CTs, let's say we've done a review of it, 121 of them, and you realize that what was out there prior to that, or what we uh, knew to be out there prior to that, didn't really make much sense. Because um, you're dealing with separate injuries. Um, so this was a paper that we published in 2017, um, is often termed the Mason and Malloy uh, uh, classification. Um, if you don't mind going on, Pedro. Um, but to bring it back a little bit first, so. This is a paper that we've done a, uh, about two years ago now on the different, uh, different st stability factors in an ankle. So you have structures preventing x-axis translation, you have structures presenting y-axis translation and uh, x-axis rotation, and what, some uh, doing the z-axis rotation. Uh, but all biomechanical studies prior to 2017 we're just looking at the uh, translation. So your front to back translation. And they were ignoring any rotational issues. But you can see the Z axis rotation on the bottom there. The posterior malleolus is part of that. So the bit that we were missing was your rotational injuries. So you can see here the, the green box on the bottom. This is where the posterior malleolus fits into. It fits into both your X axis translation and your Z axis rotation. And some more recent uh, mechanical studies now are showing that the small fragments that we used to just ignore and so are very important for rotation. And if you leave these alone uh, without uh, fixation often, then they can cause problems. Uh, and this was what the classific classification we came up with. So you had your avulsion type injuries. Uh, we turned out type ones. Your uh, type 2As and 2Bs were your rotational pylons. Uh, and we found this very difficult to... Um, get out into the literature because we kept on uh, putting uh, papers out uh, to journals and journals would just bounce them back saying there's no such thing as a rotational pylon. But a pylon is the talus hitting the, ta uh, hitting the tibia and it doesn't only have to occur with axial load, you can occur with rotational. Um, and then you have your normal axial loaded pylon, uh, which was often, again, the Hadaguchi classification was not even included. So, now, uh, Botonisek, unbeknown to us, literally came up with the same classification, but be it that they had uh, done type 2 and type 3 was our 2A and 2Bs. Uh, the Haraguchi either didn't include the type 3, or a lot of papers are now calling it the little type 1 or your big type 1. It's quite obvious within the papers that they not include them or uh, group them all together with different injuries. So, we've got some nice pretty videos. So the type 1 fracture, uh, this is, uh, occurs where the talus is not loaded. So it's often a kind of an inversion, reversion type of injury. And you can see the talus with, it, with the foot not on the floor, either rotates or pushes out uh, laterally. You often get a high fibular fracture, an avulsion injury to the medial side, and you get a pull-off type injury of PITFL. Often you get this other small fragment, which is the intermalleolar ligament pulls off just underneath your tib post. Your next one. Again, it's still a type one. You can get a type one, which is a type of supination type injury. And similarly, it's unloaded injury, so it doesn't hit the back of the tibia. Whereas the foot rotates round, you also get a pull off due to the PITFL, as you can see here. And these are the two types of type one that we see really. One with a high fibula and one with a low fibula. Type 2A minor major, this is a loaded talus. So imagine your, your studs being stuck in the ground and then the tibia is rotating on top of it. As you can see, as it's loaded, the fibula rotates off the bottom. So it's a kind of supination type injury, but then it hits the overhanging posterior malleolus. That's where you get your type 2A. 
if it continues to rotate, you get type 2B that fragments off. And this is quite typical because you'll see that the fracture pattern is very predictable. The type 2B sits underneath the type 2A because of the rotation. The type, uh, this you can see here, you can see this area. Also the impaction fragments. So if you get any impaction fragments with 2A, it's often on the lateral side. And with a 2B, it often sits in between your 2A and 2B, you get an impaction fragment there. And this is the rotation. This is what we see with the type 2B. You can see a rotational force. A true, true posterior pylon is as you expect. So a uh, plantar flex foot and axial load. Usually the, the fibula goes in the same direction. So it's usually in the same path as your, uh, as your posterior malleolar fracture. And due to the pull of the deltoid, you often get a white type fracture on the on the medial side because the anterior collicula gets pulled off. We'll show we're quite a few cases of these coming coming up now. And this is from uh, Botonis X paper, and it, it's very typical. This axial loaded pylon is very predictable. So as I said, we we need to add in this Z axis rotation, and over the last two three years, this the biomechanical studies have shown that this is really important. For rotation, it's the rotational pylon that gives you this. So to get into approaches, so there's a number of approaches available. Um, we uh, we looked at, um, at all these different fracture types and looked, okay, well, what is the best position to re both reduce and get a, a good fixation was CPL, so the most uh, um, home run screw you could get in the middle of them. And through this work, we had a, it's called a clock face approach. Go on, Pedro. And you can see we have a type, if you know type ones, which is generally a, a fixed syndesmosis rather than a fragment, your type 2A and 2B, your 2A, yes, is easily approached to the posture lateral. Your 2B and 3 have much better um, approaches through the medial side, either through the posture me, medial or medial posture medial. But I'm going to go through these now. Next one. And this is kind of a schematic of how much you can see, really. And you can see your type 2A, yes, you can see your fibula and your um, uh, postural lateral fragment very easily. But you get to your uh, type 2B, you can't get to that medial side. And uh, this is the one that uh, Matt was involved with. And you can see that the medial postural medial also gives you a much larger access to the tibia than the, than the other incisions. <laughs> 